pre past president of the Sydney Linux User Group and currently the, the, the vice president of uh, Linux Australia. Uh, he has a fetish for cooking. You'll notice that nearly all his programs are, are named after various dishes, nachos, cucumbers, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that's funny. I hand you over <laughs> Lindsay Holmwood. All right, I should probably turn this on. You all hear me? With through the microphone, I mean. Cool. <laughs> the level's fine up the back. This microphone's a bit crap. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lizzie Homewood. I'm a senior engineer at Bulletproof Networks. Um, we do posting and that sort of thing. If you're looking for a job, come and talk to me after this. Um, so I very much appreciate you all taking the track all the way down here to the other end of the university in L101. So you have crazy ideas But this is true. I'm, I'm being ostracized by the conference organizers. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, behavior-driven infrastructure and sort of the implications of infrastructure as code. So we sort of want to take a step back. Um, you probably, you may have heard of the term behavior-driven infrastructure um, through another thing called DevOps. So I'm assuming that most people here have heard heard of DevOps in one way or another? Awesome, cool. So um, this is sort of a, a technical, technical side of DevOps without so much the project management side of things. But this sort of factors into it a tiny bit. Um, and I'm assuming that most people have probably heard, uh, well, developers in the crowd definitely would have heard um, about behavior-driven development. Um, the ops people in here, do you sort of have an understanding of what behavior-driven development is? You can say no. That's cool, because that's what the first part of the talk is about. Um, and OK, so if, if we've got to understand what behavior-driven development is to sort of understand how behavior-driven infrastructure comes along and how, um, how that sort of works. So the question here is, what, what is a behavioral test? Well, to understand what a behavioral test is, we actually need to take a step back and understand what um, uh, sort of the origins of modern automated uh, software testing. So I'm not going too far back. I'm just going back to test-driven development. Um, so test-driven development um, really sort of started the renaissance of automated testing in the software industry. Um, and a very, very simple workflow, you know, not difficult to grasp at all. Um, so you're writing a test and you're running that test. Uh, and you're finding that that test fails because the system doesn't do what it's meant to do yet. Uh, and then you make the test pass by filling in the blanks or maybe mocking and stubbing and whatever. Uh, and then you're refactoring uh, the code behind the scenes to make that work. Uh, and then you just write more tests, and you're basically in this endless cycle of joy. Um, and the approach with test-driven development is very, uh, at least at the beginning, was very uh, unit test focused. So you're basically testing the input and output of functions or methods or that sort of thing. You're just looking at individual units with the system. And you're not really looking at the flow of data or the interactions uh, of users within the system. So really simple things like this. You know, you've got, uh, you're passing the foo to bar and you get a result and then you're doing some assertion on that. You're checking that the result matches some particular parameter. Um, and the common, uh, the common testing toolkit there is XUnit. So behavior-driven development is very much a reaction to the focus of those tests. Um, so we're more testing the flow of data in the system and the way that someone's actually interacting with that. Um, and really simple things, you know, very high level things like you know, you're basically testing that a user can perform a particular task. Right? You don't really care about inputs and outputs, you just care that you can accomplish a particular goal. So, and these are really high level things as well, like I just want to be able to make a donation or search for a product or check out my cart or, you know, do any of those, those standard user focused level things. And really, um, the behavior driven development um, movement was sort of born out of a bit of a business need here where there was a disconnect between what was actually being tested in the software um, and what the business was actually seeing uh, the software was delivering. So it really is about verifying uh, businesses' functional requirements are met. And because of that, the business doesn't actually care too much about the underlying implementation of the way that the system is built, right? It's actually quite irrelevant to the business. They just care that they're able to perform a particular task so that they can make money. And you're never, ever, ever going to see a business doing something like this, right? You know, it's, it's just never going to happen. So what they're really asking is, can I search for things? 
right? Or can I do any of those things that I was talking about before? You know, those, those high-level user interactions. Um, so the function in sort of the real-world sense is very, very important, not in the programming sense at all. Um, but the implementation, per se, really doesn't matter all that much. So if we're verifying that a business's functional requirements are met, then what are the tools for doing that? Well, the common ones here are integration tests and acceptance tests. And they can be manual or automatic, or it doesn't really matter too much. Um, but these have commonly been grouped uh, these days into a thing called outside-in testing. Um, so it's sort of like a grouping term for both of, those, uh, both of those different types of testing. And generally, there's been a movement in recent years towards writing executable specifications. So uh, expressing these requirements and the scope of a project um, in a format that the business can understand in high-level language, in spoken language, um, but can also be applied to, uh, you know, that can be just handed to the programmers and go, okay, go and write this and implement this. Um, and that's really about, well, it's, it's really business-oriented because it's about understanding the business, understanding what it's actually paying for. So, enough of this. Boring. Let's move on to the interesting technical stuff. So, this is about behavior-driven infrastructure, right? So, what is behavior-driven infrastructure? Well, it's really based upon this idea of infrastructure as code. So, Andrew Schaefer, one of the founders of, uh, of Puppet Labs, had this really interesting post a few years ago. Um, and this is a fantastic quote from it. And it's really, and what he's basically saying is that we're treating infrastructure um, where we're looking at it through a bit of an abstraction. So we're not looking at it as individual components um, that are sort of performing something. We're actually just looking at it as a, a single entity that you interact with. So if we take that analogy, the infrastructure is the application, right? So let's think about what all the different subcomponents of that infrastructure are. So the daemons are essential, essentially the libraries that are performing particular functions. And configuration management is actually the programming language, is the glue that's pulling all these different bits together um, to be able to, to build the application. So therefore, the infrastructure is pretty much built with code, right? If we take that to the next step, um, code without tests is pretty bad. In fact, I would go so far as to say that code without tests is evil. So behavior driven, well, and, and why is that evil? Well, Really, it's, it's because you can't easily verify that the system does what you expect it to do. It comes back to those business requirements that I was talking about before. So behavior-driven infrastructure, then, is really about taking these behavior-driven development principles and tools to a certain extent um, and adapting them to infrastructure development. So we're, we're basically, um, I suppose, cargo culting a lot of, the, a lot of the, the infrastructure and processes that they've been doing in the development world and applying that to what we're doing operationally. So. What are the tools? What are the tools for being able to do this? So the obvious one um, that's very fond to me is uh, Cucumber. So Cucumber is uh, an exe executable format for writing software specifications. Um, and it's also a tool for executing those specifications uh, using the same high-level spoken language that we were talking about before here. And the tool basically takes that and interprets that and executes code behind the scenes. So, some terminology so we can sort of understand how Cucumber fits into this. You've got a feature, and a feature is a module of common functionality. And generally, you have one feature, oh, sorry, one feature per file. Um, and this is, what a, this is what a feature looks like. Can you guys up the back see that OK? The contrast is a bit flaky. You can't? All right. My apologies. Better? Cool. <laughs> OK. so. Um, this is a really simple outline of a feature here. Um, we're just, we've just got the, the name of the feature, uh, and then we've just got this preamble. And the preamble um, is, is purely, uh, it's not actually executed at all. It's just a high level definition of what this feature is actually trying to achieve. So a feature itself has many scenarios. So a scenario is a way that a user is actually interacting with that feature. So here we're saying that uh, for the Google search, there's a home page, right? And the home page is essentially a feature of Google. We're saying that when I go to google.com.au and I search for Great Balls of Fire, then I should see Great Balls of Fire in, in the, search, the search output. And a scenario itself has many different steps. So uh, going back to what we're seeing here, um, we've got these, uh, these when, and, and then. So the, the, ones that, the steps that um, the Cucumber comes bundled with are given when 
then, and there's also an AND keyword. So a given is really about setting up a, a set of conditions for the test to be able to execute. A when is performing an interaction with that system. Uh, and then the then is you know, checking the output of that and checking that it's, it's, it matches what, whatever your expectations are. And the AND is just a tiny bit of syntactical sugar within the Cucumber file um, that, that basically executes the same, uh, same keyword above. So if I've got a, um, a when and then I do on one line and then I do an AND on the next, it'll just treat that as a when. So in this way, we can actually think of the steps themselves as being sort of like a series of unit tests. And these, uh, these steps actually map to blocks of code. So this is where the, where the rubber hits the road, pretty much. So we've got these, uh, we've got these scenarios here. Uh, and each of those steps there actually maps to a, a block of code. So uh, Cucumber internally uses regex matches. So it means that you can reuse these steps across uh, multiple scenarios and multiple features. Um, so, generally, uh, when you generate a Cucumber feature, um, sorry, when you, uh, when you run your scenario, Cucumber, Cucumber will go, oh, okay, you don't have steps for this, so it prints out a bunch of code that you can just copy and paste into a file, uh, and there'll be a pending keyword there, and then you go and fill them out. So, behind the scenes here, we're using another little library called, uh, called WebRat, and WebRat just basically handles some basic HTTP interactions. So we're saying here that we're visiting a particular location. Um, so the location here is actually being extracted from this, uh, from this group here, this regex. It's using a back reference, being assigned to this block, um, to this variable within the block. And then we're using it down here. And the same for all these other things here. You know, we've got two other grouping matches. And so the last step here is, uh, is using another thing called RSpec, which is doing these, uh, these should matches. So instead of the assertions that we were looking at before, um, we're just, it's, it's basically syntactical sugar around assertions. So um, the blocks of code themselves are like unit tests. Therefore, a scenario is a serial execution of those unit tests. That's sort of essentially what an integration test is, right? You're interacting with different bits of the system at one point at a time. Um, and then you're stringing the results of all that together to check that you know, if I do A, and then I do B, and then I do C, then I see D. So, how do we go about using this? Well, installing is pretty simple and straightforward. Um, so you do, uh, Cucumber is written in Ruby, and a distributor is a Ruby gem. So you go apt get install Ruby gems if you're on Debian or Yum install or whatever the package management of your choice is. Uh, and then you just go gem install Cucumber, and that'll install it onto your local system. So using it, um, very, very simple. Uh, there's a standard repository, sorry, a standard structure that um, that Cucumber expects to be able to find things in. So generally, you contain all your Cucumber features in a, in a directory called Features, and then you have steps in a, in a different directory called Steps. So you know, in this particular example here, I'm just doing very bare bones. I'm doing all the, all the manual work myself, um, and I can, uh, I'll go into, uh, into another little project to, um, to accelerate a lot of that development in just a moment. Um, so the testing workflow then becomes very, in fact, it was pretty much identical to what we were talking about before, where we're writing a test, uh, running that test, the test fails, make the test pass, we when we refactor, right. So the uh, example scenario that, oh, sorry, the feature and scenario that I was talking about before here, um, we, can, we can use exactly that. So we'd, uh, we'd edit this file, this features and site dot feature, uh, and then we'd, uh, we'd run that and then we'd have some steps as well. So this is all a bit abstract. Um, let's, let's sort of go through and actually play around with this. If I uninvert that, can I still read all that? <laughs> cool. All right, so um, back in the example there, I was sort of driving it, uh, driving it all manually and creating the structure. So I actually, uh, I, I run another, I, I've made this other little project called Cucumber Nagios, and it's, um, it basically uh, provides a, a Cucumber outputter that you can plug straight into Nagios. But for the example here, um, it's actually really great for, uh, for just getting up and running with Cucumber very easily. So um, if you just go gem install uh, Cucumber Nagios, which I've already done. Uh, and now if I go Cucumber Nagios gem project, and I'm just going to call it um, uh, LCA 2011. Okay, great. So uh, if we go into LCA 2011, uh, you can see here that there's a... Oh, sorry, shitty BSD. 
Um, so it's already initialized a Git repository for us, uh, and it's got a bunch of features and steps that I was talking about before. Uh, and then it's got a couple of generators in here as well. And then there's a Cucumber and Argios, uh command itself that, that wraps Cucumber to perf perform the, uh, the Cucumber, uh, the Nargios output. So um, once we're in here, we can actually run Cucumber Nargios gen uh, feature. Whoops, fat fingers today. Um, and we're gonna call it uh, website. Oh, sorry, that's wrong. I'm gonna go uh, LCA 2011 and then website. So if I go into features, LCA 2011 website.feature, it generates all the scaffolding code for us here. So um, really simple, it just should be up. So when I visit LCA 2011, well that's obviously wrong, uh, .linux.org.au, then the request should succeed. Okay, so now if I go Cucumber features LCA 2011 and website, and I run that, Okay, so Cucumber here is going, well, I don't know about what these steps actually are, what, you, what you're asking me to do, so please give me some code to be able to do that. So there's an, actually an option that we just go dash dash require features, and then I get a wonderful breakage. Oh, all right, awesome, sorry, I missed a step there. I was ignoring my own install instructions. So uh, if you go bundle install to uh, pull in a bunch of these dependencies, so behind the scenes, actually, if I... Uh, uh, Cucumber and Argios has a whole bunch of dependencies um, that, that are required to make stuff work. So things like uh, like like Aspect, the testing framework, um, WebRat for doing H uh, HTTP interactions, NetSSH, MQP, that sort of thing. So if I just run that, that's going to take a minute. Why don't we... Um, so actually, if we can just look at Cucumber and Nargiosis for a second while we're waiting. We'll invert that. There we go. Um, so Cucumber and Nargios is just a very simple wrapper around Cucumber itself that, uh, that outputs the stuff in the, uh, in, in the Nargios plugin format. Um, so there are a bunch of options that you can pass to it, and we're just basically saying here that we want to use the, uh, the, the Nargios outputter for Cucumber. You can write, a whole, uh, you can write your own custom formatter. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that comes bundled with Cucumber as well. Um, so there's a standard pretty one, which gives you that nice output that we were seeing before, um, back in the slides. Um, there's, uh, there's a, uh, a JUnit outputter. Um, yeah, a, ho a whole bunch of different things out there. Almost done. prepared that better. Is there anything else in here? Oh yeah, okay, and the other thing that's probably worth looking at is uh, this env.rb. So Cucumber internally will run this before uh, before it tries to execute any of the uh, any of the features that you pass it. And basically you can load in your own, uh, you can require your own libraries and load in your own code and, and that sort of thing up here. So it's sort of like a, a global require that, that gets executed. Okay, so let me try that again. Um, This is fantastic, considering it worked a second ago. <sighs> Sigh. Uh. Oh, really? Yeah. <sighs> wow, this is awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh. the exact. Sorry about this. This was working perfectly about five minutes ago and now it's exploded in my face. Uh, okay, let me try. Okay, I think I know how to fix this. It's a perfect opportunity to rant about how absolutely crap Bundler is. But I'm not going to. All right, you know what, we'll, uh, we'll come back to that in a minute because that's going to take another five minutes or so. Okay, so um, now that we're able to uh, write these high-level tests for the way that you interact with your infrastructure, um, it'd be, it's sort of interesting to talk about what the implications of those are, you know, when we're treating the infrastructure as code itself. So, uh, 
I might do is take us out of that. There we go. So um, one of the interesting things when I was talking about sort of cargo culting what, uh, what the development community is doing, we can use a whole bunch of their existing tools like continuous integration um, for testing the stuff that, uh, that we're building. So the prime example of that is testing the server build. So you have a, a whole bunch of high level tests for the way that you expect a particular server to operate or a series of servers to operate. Um, and, you, uh, and you would run those tests on every time that you do a check-in to your continuous inter uh, to, uh, sorry your configuration management system so you could use something like you know Hudson or Jenkins or whatever <laughs> to create a whole bunch of uh, clean room VMs apply those puppet manifests or chef recipes or whatever uh, and run those tests against them it's an interesting way of spotting regressions and testing that the behavior and the environment is still the same when you're adding new features um, but the question then becomes, well, what environments are we running these tests against? So, you know, do we run these against UAD or staging or, heaven forbid, production? Or are we doing clean room environments every time? Um, you know, the, one of the interesting implications there is perhaps when you're running the tests, you want to do it on uh, a bunch of clean room VMs, but maybe at the same time, um, you want to have a whole bunch of older VMs that have, that have had the configuration previously run against it, and see that if you run that same configuration against it, that it behaves in exactly the same way. Um, and what about destructive tests? You know, in, uh, in the development world, um, the, the common way that you deal with this is with fixtures. Right? So fixtures are essentially test data that you feed into the system before you're running any of these tests to set up a bunch of states so that you know you have users to log in with and there are, might be orders in the system or something like that. Um, and that's using a very simple setup and teardown pattern. But how do you apply that to an infrastructure setting where um, you know you don't want to do setup and teardown of the data on a live production system, right? You know, it's just a it, it, just, it, it has all sorts of really nasty implications. Um, so one of the ways that you, maybe you could do that is with A-B testing, where you're segregating part of your infrastructure that you just uh, run these tests against, and it doesn't really, you know, you, you write a, you have a bunch of fail-safes behind the scenes that are able to catch the data, the test data that's being written. Um, but then again, you know, you've, uh, it, it's, it's quite an interesting problem because now that you've implemented all this extra stuff on top of it, you're not actually testing what's really happening in production. So I don't have any clean cut answers to that. I'd be really interested to have a discussion about that um, here or later or whenever. Um, one of the other interesting implications is uh, the migration to a configuration management system from uh, doing all your stuff by hand, so rolling your own servers by hand. Um, so imagine that you've got you know, uh, an old legacy environment that was set up a while ago um, that some, you know, some person that's since left the company um, set up. And there's no real documentation, but it's business critical. You know, I'm sure you've all seen hundreds of servers like this in, you know, in your time in the corporate world. So um, how, do you, how do you take that? And you, know, you, you obviously want to use configuration management to reduce the risk of that server basically exploding and then you know, business being without that critical system. So behavior-driven infrastructure and, behave, and using behavior-driven development um, principles is quite interesting here because what you can do is you can write a whole bunch of tests that model the behavior and test the behavior of the existing system, um, make sure that they all pass, all that sort of thing, then take exactly the same tests and do them and run them in a new environment right? that you're managing with, uh, with configuration management. Um, so again, you know, that's where the implementation doesn't actually matter all that much. You just care, you, you, you care about the behavior. You're just testing the behavior behind the scenes. Um, and back on the continuous integration front as well, there's this interesting crossover here uh, in the ops world that we have with monitoring systems. So if you look at what a continuous integration system itself is actually doing, um, it's very simple. It's just this life cycle of, oh, in fact, it's more of a pipeline of building a piece of software taking that built artifact and deploying it onto a system somewhere and maybe setting up a bit of test data, then running a series of tests against that, and then you're notifying uh, somebody, or maybe you're not notifying, um, when, uh, when that test either passes or fails. So the interesting thing here is that a monitoring system is basically doing exactly the same thing, except we don't care about building or deploying the software. Right? So we're sort of already doing this in some ways, but we sort of just collapse these four steps down into two because the other stuff has already been done for us. And that leads to an interesting question about the way the monitoring is currently being done, 
which in my opinion, I sort of think that we've been asking a lot of the wrong questions. You know, if you look at the sort of questions, the standard sort of monitoring checks that you've got, they're a ping to a server or they're doing a TCP connect and seeing that, you know, you get a response. You might, you might do some sort of HTTP interaction. But even then, it's just, you know, you hit a page and you check that there's a string available on that page. Um, and those, those sort of checks are basically asking these two types of questions. You're basically saying, you know, is this host up uh, or is the service available? And the problem there is that it doesn't take into account all these different corner cases, like what happens if the network stack of the machine is broken, but, you know, the checks are still passing. Well, sorry, the network stack is up, but the rest of the system is broken. You know, how do you, how do you, that, that test doesn't really capture that particular corner case, that failure mode. And what about the service availability? Well, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't really check the stuff where someone's misconfigured a service. And it's, you know, you, you might have, you might still have that page. You might be checking for like the copyright notice on the bottom of the page. But if you've got a whole bunch of, you know, database and PHP errors above it, then that check is essentially worthless. And what about bugs triggered by user data as well? You know, uh, a lot of the testing that's done on these systems is just done with clean room data. It's stuff that, stuff that developers um, think that uh, there is data that's going to be created at some point. But it doesn't take into consideration things like, you know, people trying out cross-site scripting attacks and that sort of thing. And, and that obviously leads to the inevitable what happens if the system's been hacked. You know, you might not really know about that. Um, so I'm guessing most of the operations people in the room here are going to go, well, why should I care about this really? Because, you know, the, the, the examples that you gave here are very, very simple. Um, quite often, you know, I'm, I'm using my own tests in my environment that are, that are doing much more complex things here. So, the thing, the reason that you should really care, um, you know, and none of your checks already do that. In fact, um, I've, I've heard anecdotally that Google is doing very similar sort of things internally, um, with a whole bunch of smaller checks that are, that aren't themselves doing any sort of notification. But you've got another master check on top that's sort of taking aggregate of all of those. Um, so the the thing here is that Cucumber really provides a framework for phrasing these questions. These keywords that I was talking about, the given, the when, the then, right? It's all about modeling these interactions. And it lowers the barrier of entry, really, to writing these good checks, or better checks, I suppose. Um, the only caveat here is that you need to have a firm grasp of the language, right? You know, there are, if, if, you don't, if you don't have exceptionally good, well, not even exceptionally good, but if you don't have reasonable communication skills, it's very easy to be ambiguous in when you're writing these, these cucumber scenarios. This is a fantastic example here. Perfectly valid cucumber, right? You know that those blocks of code there are going to map to something. So you know, your system, your system could be working, right? But if somebody looks at that, nobody's going to have an absolute clue what it's doing. You know, not only is it completely valid, it's also completely useless. So you've got to be really careful about how you phrase a lot of this stuff. And you know, and I, it's, it's a trap that you know, I've been writing cucumber for. We're going on three years now, and it's still a trap that I sometimes fall into with, with ambiguity. Sure, sorry. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, so the interesting thing here, though, is that Cucumber is essentially providing a common specification uh, a specification format that both developers and operations can share. So you can have a lot more cross-team communication um, between the people who are writing the code and the people that are managing the code in production. Um, but more importantly, it's actually something that the IT department as a whole uh, and the business itself can share. So the business is a lot more informed about what we're actually doing and what we're actually testing. Um, and the cool thing here is that it's sort of actually removing a whole bunch of duplication of tests because you'll find that in a traditional software development environment, you know, you've got a whole bunch of automated tests, but then when the software gets packaged up and thrown over the wall to the operations team, mm -hmm. they go off and they go, well, what the hell am I monitoring? Right? And they'll go off and they'll write their own checks and maybe, it, maybe it's checking for the same thing or maybe it isn't. Right? There's, there's, a, there's a lack of information transfer there between the two teams. Um, so when you've got all these tests that are being written in development and these other tests that are, that are also being written in production, um, oh, that's horrible. God, I hate these projectors. There we go. Um, you can really think of Cucumber features as being a liberalized form of tests, right? You know, you've got to, you're running the same tests, but the implementation, 
you know, this, this is exactly the same specification. You're, you're describing the way the system should work and someone interacts with the system in exactly the same way. But the implementation behind the scenes is quite significantly different, right? And you know, that, that lets you take into, into, into account things like operational constraints. Um, you know, you, you don't want to pound the system too hard when you're running these tests, especially for intensive tests as well. Like, you know, you might, you might want to be test. Say you're running a video uploading service. You might want to test what happens when I upload this, uh, this particular video, right? You know, if, you, if you're uploading, you know, hundreds of megs of data in a, re in a request, then uh, you're, you know, that's obviously going to have an operational impact uh, on, the, uh, on, on the way that the infrastructure uh, is performing, right? So there's an interesting thing here in, uh, in Cucumber, where I'll go back to in, in fact, I might go back to right now. <sighs> Sorry. Did that really say? Oh, this is a shambles, isn't it? Do I have any? Uh... Hey, I do, okay. Uh, Cucumber, Nargios, Jam, LCA, 2011.linux.org.au, uh, and home. Whoops. Uh, well, that's presenting for you. <laughs> um, all right, if we, if we just go and have a look at this actually here, uh, I'll try and illustrate. Um, so there's a, there's a concept of tagging on a scenario um, where, uh, where you can basically go, okay, well, uh, I'm going to write this tag of, say, production, and then I might have uh, another five tests that are you know, all doing the same sort of thing, maybe. But this one you only want to run in staging, for example. Or well, this one you, know, you don't want to even run at all. Um, so when you run uh, Cucumber against these, um, there's a, uh, a dash dash tags option. So you can go dash dash tags production, sorry, at production. And it will only run the, the scenarios that are tagged with production. So this is an interesting way that you can share uh, a lot of the specification. Oh, sorry, it's more that um, the development team is very, very aware of what is operationally important to, uh, to the business, right? Because you know, they're there, they're writing the software, um, they know what the business cares about. And if you, if you really take it down to it, there's probably only, in most businesses, two or three core functions that you want to be working all the time so you can make money. Um, so what the development team can do is they can take uh, those, those scenarios that, that test that vitally important mission critical uh, uh, thing, the function of the business, and they can tag them with production and then hand them over to the, production, the operations team and then they can go, okay, well, these are the tests that I need to actually implement and only run in production. Um, so that's an interesting way of increasing the, the communication and the collaboration between the two teams there. All right, so I've sort of, sort of explained where we were coming from and sort of where we're going to, but where, where do we really, well, what's, the, what's the next step from here? Well, the interesting thing about this and infrastructure as code and behavior-driven infrastructure is that it means that everyone's going to start writing a bit more code, operations in particular. Um, but it means that we're, we, we end up writing more code to automate more things. And obviously, if we're going to be writing more code um, because of things like the cloud and whatnot, where you know, we just have a lot more systems, a lot easier to manage them programmatically than log into a 1,000 servers you know, individually and run some particular task. Um, if we're writing more code, then you know, if, we're, if we're going to treat this as a, as a disciplined software engineering practice, then we're also going to need to be able to write more tests for that. So I, I don't think you know, in, in the future it's going to really become um, uh, it's really going to be okay for operations folk not to be able to understand how to write even just a small amount of code. Um, and the interesting thing about writing code is that eventually patterns are going to fall out of the stuff that we're doing. You know, common common architectures for um, for deploying applications and building infrastructure. So uh, a, a really obvious example of that is um, is the, uh, the the three tiered 
web architecture that was sort of pioneered in the late 90s and very much popularized by the likes of Facebook and, and Twitter, where you've got a bunch of application servers sitting up the top, and then you've got uh, some caching servers and then a database server underneath it, right? You know, that's a very common pattern. That's, that's, most, that's how, most high availability, how most high availability websites are being built these days, right? Um, so that's an interesting infrastructure pattern. Um, the, uh, so Steve Jin from VMware as well has been writing an interesting series of blog posts over the last three or so months where he's describing common patterns for provisioning virtual machines and using virtualized infrastructure. Um, so you're starting to see these patterns emerging from, uh, from the way that we're doing stuff operationally. You know, and we're very much at the beginning of, um, of the renaissance, I suppose, you know, where, where basically the operations community and the infrastructure as code idea is very much sort of what back where, back where software development was in the early 90s, really. Um, so interesting patterns are definitely going to start emerging. Um, that's that's going to be really, really exciting. Um, the obvious thing here is expanding the library of these common tests and these common interactions so that we sort of have a, a de facto standard that we can point to um, to, test these, uh, to test these different types of systems and reuse them. Um, one example of the, uh, of the cucumber stuff. Uh, so if we look at features, steps. Um, so Cucumber Nagios itself comes bundled with a whole bunch of different steps um, for doing these common interactions. So uh, a really simple one is command steps. So this is a, this is a nice contribution from Opscode, the guys behind Chef. Uh, and really simple things like, you know, when I run a particular command, um, then you know, I, something should exist, or some, I should see some particular output on the, uh, on the command line, right? You know, these are really common interactions that you're doing all the time. Um, so, you know, Cucumber Nagios is sort of becoming a library of these common operation steps, um, but it'd be really interesting to see more contributions and more of these systems sort of modeled. Um, you know, a couple of other really simple examples like, uh, I mean, that, the HTTP steps are, um, are a really simple example. And my keyboard decides to work. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good idea. By the end of next session, John, if you really want it. <laughs> um, yeah, there's uh, there's some interesting stuff that came out in the uh, in the cucumber community uh, at the end of last year, um, where uh, it's basically a web app for looking at these different types of scenarios. Uh, sorry, these different steps, uh, and it's it's you can just browse through it basically and find the step that you want, and then sort of click through and you get the snippet of code and you can just copy paste it into your uh, into your application. Um, so yeah, sort of having a forge of these common uh, these common infrastructure interactions would be would be really cool. Um, And you know the obvious thing is just explaining to everyone. You know, um, once once you're doing it and you're getting a good feel for it, explaining to people the importance of doing this, because there isn't really, uh, I suppose, a culture of software craftsmanship within the operations community. You know, we're we're sort of very insular. We're very focused on you know this is the way that it's always been and it's the way that it's always going to be, um, and we don't want any of that crazy agile hipster behavior-driven development stuff, right? So you know. Unfortunately, you know, I, I would love to live in a world where we didn't have to change, but ch change is inevitable, obviously. So, as we're moving more towards infrastructure as code, then you know, we need to we need to be able to talk to people about the importance of these concepts and applying software uh, software engineering principles um, to to the development of, of, of infrastructure. So, um, I'd like to open up a bit of a discussion here if, uh, if people want to ask questions and. Um, I can bang away getting in Cucumber and RGOS working behind the scenes at the same time. <laughs> yes? So, um, basically, uh, okay, we're, from my workplace, we've got a uh, bunch of machines, each with. Um, we have Nedios running. You answer questions, I'll try and get them right. We have. Uh, uh, the machines doing some uh, local tests which uh, send a trap to Nedios um, when something goes wrong, mm -hmm. or goes right. Um, and many of we write the code to implement these tests and they test for whatever seems appropriate. Um, I'm just trying to understand the difference between, um, you know, at least in terms of monitoring. Uh, between what we're doing and what you're um, 
what you're uh, evangelizing. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's actually a really, really good question. So how does how does behavior-driven testing and behavior-driven infrastructure fit into? You got it working? Also, I did vandal exact. Okay, work. cool. Um, how, how does that fit into uh, traditional monitoring environments? So I see the sort of test that you're talking about, which is basically statistic collection and then just checking particular values, um, to to be uh, quite separate to this behavior-driven infrastructure stuff. Uh, I see them working in conjunction with one another. Um, but the, the low-level tests that you're talking about here um, uh, are more for, uh, I suppose, triggering, um, triggering warnings about stuff that might happen or is about to happen, right? So stuff that, you know, your, your website can be performing. You, you could be executing all these behavior-driven tests against your, uh, against your website, and it's all working, but it can be running slow as a dog, right? So a lot of... But then there'd, there'd be a response time. You know, there's a, the, the code measures the response time, so um, that would come into what uh, what Nadia Salam said. Sure, 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 sure. I mean, I, I see um, I see the behavior-driven test as being a layer on top of the the lower-level test that you're talking about here. You know, talking about very low-level statistic collection, um, statistical analysis, that sort of thing. Um, the uh, Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, I, I probably wasn't clear enough there. So the, the comment here was, I'm, I'm adding to the tests. I'm not replacing them. Um, you know, the, these low-level uh, statistic collection and value comparison sort of things, absolutely valid, very, very important. Um, you know, this is absolutely not a replacement for it. It's, it's changing the perspective of uh, how we're actually developing these systems and, uh, I suppose, providing a more business-friendly way of, uh, of testing these interactions and testing that they're actually receiving the value that they're paying for. Well, uh, there was there a question up the back here. Over here? Sorry. Yes. yes. Um, the problem with any sort of test code, obviously, is going to be um, the coverage of the tests and when a problem does occur, um, digging down and finding the underlying cause. Now, given that you already have the configuration, is pretty much a specification of the entire service. Like if you scan through the um, like the web server config and then um, looking at the logs um, gives you the behavior. What scope do you see for being able to basically automate a much well a lot of the test creation through like analyzing the config and the behavior from the logs? Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. Um, so that's that's something that I haven't quite gotten to thinking about. But my initial reaction to that is well. Right now, these cucumber steps actually aren't very well parameterized. Um, when, you, when you parameterize them, you're actually, you've actually got to write some stuff into the scenarios themselves. So um, one of the things about becoming Nagios compatible, actually, is that you've got to be able to provide um, a bunch of these random arguments on the command line and be able to inject them into, uh, into these scenarios. So right now, technically, cucumber Nagios isn't 100% Nagios compatible in that way. Um, I, suppose the, uh, I suppose what you're talking about there is when I automate some infrastructure to, uh, to deploy a web server or an application server or whatever it is, um, how do you make sure that those tests match up with, with that? So you're sort of talking about constructing the tests on the fly based on um, based on how the individual components interact with one another. Based on how the computer and then just the history of the Chaps, if you have got a microphone, we can't hear you on the AV system. And I've got two people waiting here now, and that's the last two questions we can run. Right, we'll finish this later. <laughs> yes. You talked about at the start, uh, obviously using. Um, almost the description as a software specification. Yes. Um, and I see that as you've sort of come from the bottom up from testing low level unit things right up to trying to describe hence behavioural. For that truly to take on, what extra work are you doing to enable someone who is going to define a software specification to test your infrastructure and make sure that what they, the business has paid for or thinks they've paid for, they're actually getting? That's, uh, that's a good question. So, um, um, actually, can I just add something wrong to his sure, question sure. really quick? Um, from what, what you've described is, from where I said, a ton of extra work for a ton of extra people. So the, the developers now have to write not only their tests for their own code, but also how their code's going to be deployed. 
then the sysadmins are going to have to take those cucumber features and write the code, you know, to fill in the reg apps and the da 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 da. And then on top of that, they're already maintaining their monitoring systems and they're already maintaining their puppet systems or their chef systems or whatever. Um, we know perfectly well that the business people are not going to be writing any of those cucumber features. So, so now, now we have this have additional layer <laughs> where, where all these people are going to be doing all this extra work. And so you know, maybe you could talk about you know, what, why we would go through all that extra work and what, what are we getting for all that? Uh, I don't see it as extra work per se, and I have to disagree with what you were saying there about how the business people aren't writing these cucumber scenarios. I mean, that's exactly where these specifications are coming from, by talking to the business and finding out exactly what their requirements are and what the specification is. They're not writing it. No, I, I disagree. In fact, if you know, it's it's like a standard BA cycle in uh, in, in any sort of software evaluation when you're when you're building a system, right? You know, you, you need to talk to the business people, and quite often. You, you, you know, Cucumber is, is a easy enough tool for them to be able to understand. So I don't see it as being a, as being a separate thing. I see that the business people are helping the software developers write the write the specifications. The specification is executable. They're not writing any extra different tests. It's just it's just changing the way slightly that they're doing it. Um, and then they can take exactly the same specification and hand it over to the operations team. Um, and you know, this, that, half of the work is already done for you by writing the features in the first place by writing the specification. So I don't, I don't actually see it as much as, I suppose it's just that we have a slightly different worldview about where we're coming from, from, from this. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Thank you very much, David, uh, Lindsay. Uh, on behalf of the Linux uh, conference here, except a small gift, it's a macadamia nut bowl made from crushed shells, and same as the one that Vince Cerf got the other day. Thank you very much. Put your hands together.